ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Banter for Believers. Everybody, this is Tate Ellison, your host for Banter for Believers, and today joining me I have David Hayward, the Naked Pastor. A little bit about David Hayward: he has a master's in theological studies from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, a diploma in religious studies and ministry from McGill University in Montreal, and a diploma in university teaching from the University of New Brunswick. He served the church as a pastor for 30 years and left the ministry in 2010. He is a graffiti artist. Naked Pastor uses words and images to challenge the status quo and offer hope for those who struggle and suffer under it. He founded and facilitates The Lasting Supper, an online community for those looking for a safe alternative to church. David, thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, yeah, absolutely. To be here. I've been kind of following you a little bit here on Twitter. I think that's how we connected. I, you know, yeah. you know how Twitter works. Somebody likes something that you follow, and it shows up. And yeah. it's very good networking uh, 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 site uh, yeah. in that respect. Um, of course, you got to filter through a lot of the uh, other BS that, that comes along. <laughs> People yeah. want to troll you, and 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 those kind of things, understandably, but. Yeah. Uh, tell me why why naked pastor? I think I have an idea, but why the name naked pastor? I chose the name naked pastor because at the time I was uh, pastoring a local congregation. I was blogging, and um, I wanted to blog in a way that people would be able to see behind the curtain of a pastor's life, like to be able to really really know it was really going on in the life of a real pastor of a real church so i i wanted i, I was going to be honest i was going to be transparent i was going to be unadorned i was going to be truthful and vulnerable and raw and um so uh, i thought the word naked pastor was perfect uh, at that time the naked chef was popular the naked archaeologist and it basically just means you know whittling everything down to the raw basic uh essential and so i that's what I, I i did with my blog i just let people see my life as a pastor with all of its ups and downs and joys and struggles and frustrations and doubts and questions and all the all that thing so that that's why the name naked pastor and and it you know by the time i left the ministry in 2010 it already become kind of like a brand <laughs> so uh I, di I didn't drop it. I chose to keep it. And some people suggest to me, I'm still kind of acting like a pastor, but online, or I'm a pastor without his church on one or the other. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get chills. Just it, there's not much transparency within the church as far as, uh, because we typically as, as, as people, I mean, it's human nature. We want to put pastors on pedestals. We see yeah. them on stage, the lights on them. They're giving this, this, uh, message. Yeah. And that's what we typically do. And we, we forget that they're human like the rest right. of us. They have yeah. struggles and doubts behind the scenes, as you say, behind the curtain. And right. yes, it, it, of course, when you said naked, I, my initial thought was that's a, a vulnerable place to be. You know, right. you, the story of Adam and Eve, they realized they were naked. All of a sudden, they're in a vulnerable state. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, you look at it that way. And so... Uh, how yeah, I difficult has that been for you to yeah. be be so vulnerable? Well, it it uh, it cost me my uh, career as a pastor. It you know it ended up um, people couldn't handle me being that honest, and um, you know I don't think I'm I was any different than any other pastor. I I know a lot of pastors. I have a great amount of respect for pastors i love pastors i empathize with pastors because i was one for so many years yeah. it's it's a hard job it's a tough job a tough call and um so uh i i wanted people to know that that even though we are as henry Nowen might 
call us wounded healers. We, uh, there was so much emphasis on the healer part that very few people really saw the wounded part of what it means to be a pastor. So I was just honest, sharing my struggles and my doubts and my frustrations and my, 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 my uh, wrestling match with the organized church and the and leadership and authority and um, theology, like everything. I, I just, I laid it all out there and until, you know, it got to the point where people were like, mm, I'm not sure he's called to be a pastor anymore. <laughs> and that sort of led to my... Uh, it's interesting that other people are the one that make make that decision for you. Yeah, uh, I think. Thanks very much. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, all said and done, uh, it was the best move I ever made. Uh, not the best move I ever made, but it was a smart move. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing now. I feel like I'm still in the game, uh, and I'm helping um, a lot more people right now too, uh, who are struggling with the same things and uh don't have uh don't have a you know anybody to listen to them or hear them or vent to or to, to struggle alongside so I'm, I'm happy i i did leave the ministry in 2010 even though it took me a long time to adjust um but i i have adjusted and uh enjoying it you so that kind of differentiate you say it wasn't this it was a smart move but not the best move how would you differentiate between those well, because I've made better moves, that's all. For example, marrying my wife <laughs> and having our three kids and, you know, things like that. Like, uh, um, were you celibate or were you like not, I mean, how, how long have you been married now? I mean, were you saying that was a, that was a better move, marrying your wife? Were you like a, a, a priest? You couldn't marry? Or? <laughs> no. no, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Oh, congratulations. I've been married 40 years, man. I can't believe it. I don't even feel like I'm 40 years old. And uh, no, so when I, when I, when I said uh, it was the best move I ever made, you know, there were a lot of, a lot better moves like marrying my wife and, you know, this, that, the other thing. But uh, it was, it was a, it was a decision I felt I had to make because um, the leadership of uh, our denomination and so on were expressing concern they were wanting to edit my blog posts before I post them and all this kind of thing. And it was just like, I knew my time was up. And so uh, when the time came and it became very clear one night at a meeting, church meeting, I realized, you know what, I'm, I'm done. You know, I just felt the, uh, my um, equity in the congregation was going to start going down uh, because too many people were starting to question my role as a pastor, my calling as a pastor, my theology, my all, all this other thing. And, and even though it was a great congregation uh, and I have great memories and uh, we have great friends and a great leadership team and a really wonderful sense of community and everything, my, you know, and our separation was amicable at the time. Um, it, it was a, a difficult decision to make, but one that had to be made for, for the church's health and also for mine. So true. Yeah. So uh, tell me, give me a little bit of your background. Did did you grow up uh, a fundamentalist uh, Christian, or can you mm -hmm. kind of go into to uh, were you called into ministry, so to speak? Um, I I was born uh, Anglican, which would be your Episcopal there in the United States, uh, and baptized as a baby and everything. And we sort of hopped around church, different churches, weren't really faithful to any one denomination or anything, but when I was a teenager, we ended up getting born again in a Baptist church and then switched to Pentecostal. And then I went to Bible college at a Pentecostal Bible college, Springfield, Missouri. And that's where I met my wife, Lisa, who is also a Pentecostal. And then um, I went to seminary, switched to Presbyterian. And where does your heresy stop? I know, I know. I've been everywhere. I call myself my own ecumenical movement because I've been around. <laughs> And, uh, and then uh, we ended up in the vineyard. So okay. that's the, the, the last church we served was a vineyard church. So uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I did the whole born again thing uh, and the whole Pentecostal thing. 
and you know the reformed theology thing and then the vineyard thing and you know with prophecy and healing and miracles and all that kind of stuff and worship and music and everything i did all i've, I've been everywhere i've seen it all and uh you know it was uh it was just um i it, i ended up in the vineyard because i actually felt very comfortable there i felt i had room to grow uh, and I did for a long time until I realized there was a line. I, I didn't see it was, I kind of compare it to uh, invisible fencing, you know, that you have for your dog. Mm -hmm. I, I, thought, I thought I was in a wide open space, but I discovered the invisible fence and um, gave me quite a shock and uh, realized um, I either had to stay within those boundaries or, you know, take off. And I, I ended up taking off, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's kind of the common theme you see in Christianity is, yeah, God gives us this big, wide open space, but, you know, he provides some kind of boundary for people, uh, you know, to not cross. Yeah. Um, do you do you agree with that? or You mean... <laughs> That it gives the impression that you're you've got. Well, you know, what's typical of fundamentalists is we God set a standard, and as Christians, what we tend to do is we tend to uh, make that mm -hmm. area smaller mm -hmm. to not uh, break that that standard, if you will. Yes, no, that's I'd agree with that. Uh, and for me, I think I think freedom is freedom, wide open, but. Uh, I, I think the default, um, I hesitate to use the word default, but it seems that when um, religion organizes and establishes authority and, you know, uh, a hierarchy of authority and accountability uh, and so on, that things, the, the freedom starts narrowing and borders are established and boundaries are are staked in and uh you know you're you you discover that um even though we talk about freedom there that most of the people i know aren't and and it kind of goes both ways because um <clears throat> i know as as a pastor uh, a, con a congregation full of free people is very chaotic and a lot of pastors don't like chaos they like order and um but on, on the other hand a lot of people don't like freedom um i i have actually had people sit down in front of me in my pastor's office and tell me we pay you to tell us what to believe and how to live our lives it's not my job it's your job as a pastor to tell me and uh so people would rather be told how to live and what to think than figure that out for themselves and I kind of compare it to the Israel Israelites leaving Egypt. You know, that wasn't a happy, you know, party vacation time. I mean, they were, they were launching out into years of high risk uh, struggle in the desert. Right. So but, much so they wanted to go back to where they were. And you want to go back to the security and the comfort of the leeks and onions, right? right. But it, it means slavery, but at least there's security. Or go through this turmoil of uh, your, your own personal desert to get to the place of freedom, the land of flowing with milk and honey kind of thing, uh, which is, you know, I think it's symbolic for that freedom. And, you know, that story, I think I, I use that a lot to describe the, the decision that has to be made if you want to be free. It's, it's not, a lot of people are afraid of it. It's uh, risky and it's scary. And, um, you know, it can take a while for us to really finally feel it. But um, I just encourage people to, you know, give it a shot and go for it rather than stay in the comfort zone, you know. I think I've always, uh, you know, uh, questioned my, my parents were very, uh, you know, they, they, they shaped me and they molded me and, and things. There was foundation, but they yep. always allowed me to, to question things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think well, that's great. But at a certain age, I mean, you, you, those things, those, those things that you 
uh, foundations, you, you start to at least question a little bit more, uh, yeah. dig deeper. Um, and so where did, when did you find yourself at that crossroads that you were really kind of beginning to, to question and, and understood what was taking place? Um, well, yeah, I grew up in a very conservative environment, of course, Baptist and Pentecostal and so on. And so, uh, I grew up uh, totally in love with the Bible and totally believing it was completely inerrant mm -hmm. and inspired and infallible, you know, all those words. Right. And um, I, you know, sure, I questioned, you know, Jonah and the whale and the, you know, the flood and um, six day creation and think, you know, but, but that wasn't really serious for me. <clears throat> but when I was in seminary, uh, I was graduating from seminary. I read a book that uh, talked about the core sayings of Jesus that most um, uh, historical Jesus scholars believe that Jesus might have said. And there were only a handful of them compared to, you know, the Gospels that are full of sayings of Jesus and stories and so on. Anyway, this book um, talked about the core sayings of Jesus. Anyway. Whether or not you believe that uh, and the, the whole search for the historical Jesus and all, all that um, research, what it did for me was it, it was kind of like a, a, a virus, you know, bad timing, I guess, right now with uh, COVID-19, but it was kind of like a virus was inserted into my computer system and just started eating away at the, at the core code in my theology. And it, it took many, many, many years, like compared to a glacial slow melt, like climate change is slowly melting. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was very unsettling. I remember when I put that book down, it was graduation day from seminary. And I was freaking out inside because here I built my whole theology <coughs> and um, sort of cast my future in the shadow of this whole, you know, biblical inerrancy thing. And now it, it was thrown into question and I was, I was freaking out and it took, you know, I wrestled with this all through my ministry trying to figure out the answer. Um, and uh, finally got resolution many, many, many years later, but it was the next year I finally left the ministry. So my deconstruction, a lot of people, we talk about deconstruction, people who lose, you know, change their beliefs or whatever. Some, for some people it's sudden, um, maybe a year, maybe two, maybe three. For me, it was decades. It took my, my deconstruction was very slow and methodical, um, but no less uncomfortable. Yeah. How, how has your wife, uh, 40 years, seeing you go through this process, um, mm. you know, because I think it's difficult because you've got the whole, don't be unequally yoked and, and that tension there, you know, uh, how, how she supported you in this? Or yeah, how she... it's a good question. Um, in fact, um, uh, I've written a whole book on this, um, on, on marriage and deconstruction, and I'm just about to send it to the printer. Uh, because I see a lot of couples who um, enter into you know, where one or the other questions their belief or their relationship with the church or both. And it really throws a wrench into their whole marriage. <clears throat> so Lisa and I, you know, we were very, very much on the same page. You know, we met in a Bible college and, you know, went to seminary and, and entered into the ministry. And we were very much a team all the way through. And um, so, you know, my, my deconstruction was so gradual, like I said, it was like a, a glacial melt. It was, wasn't anything horrifically surprising. It was just a very slow thing. What really threw us for a loop, though, was when my, my sort of theological deconstruction was over and I, I was, uh, my theology was way different than it was, you know, years ago but it affected our relationship with the church so that now we were outside the church. We'd left the ministry, we'd left the church as, you know, official members. 
And that was very unsettling. And it took us a couple of years to find her balance again. But we, we nearly lost our marriage during that time after we left the ministry. Mm. It, was, it was a tough go. I talk all about that in this book I've, I've got coming out. Um, and I'm very honest and open about it because I see it happen to a lot of people. It's a tough process to go through um, because it's a, you know, a new way of being. You know, we, we, we had to figure out how to love one another again because we used to think, you know, being on the same page spiritually and everything was kind of like one of the major uh, ingredients in the glue that held us together. And when that was gone, we had to figure out, okay, why, why are we together? You know, and uh, so it took a while to figure that out. But we did, thank goodness. And, you know, we just celebrated 40 years. So <clears throat> good. Congratulations. Yes. That's beautiful. I, I want to direct people to your, your Twitter. Uh, and I'll put that down, uh, link that at the bottom here uh, right. later. Uh, Twitter.com backslash naked pastor I'm actually going to share the screen here let me know if this works and that you see this do you see my screen yes and do you see your page up yeah good 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 that's me uh, so you're you're a graffiti artist you said graffiti artists on the walls of religion i guess you would say you know when you're graffitiing you're kind of uh it, it's it's almost considered vandalism if you will uh <laughs> and, and so when I, when I read that, I'm like, okay, he's, he's, he's really going there with this stuff. And uh, of course, there's, I'm going to flip through some of these that I've seen uh, here. And of course, you can get these prints uh, at, at nakedpastorstore.com. Right. And let's see. Okay, here we go. I saw another one. Oh, go, go make disciples. First of all, I, I like zombies. I think zombies are all the rage right now. Um, <laughs> This is somewhat reminiscent. I don't know if you know Steve Taylor. Uh, he was a satirical Christian artist, but he had a song called, uh, 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 what was it? Uh, Be a clone or, uh, you know, cloneliness yeah. is next to godliness. Yeah. You know, if you're going to act like one of his children, you got to act like one of us. Yeah. You know, and so that was the message. That's what I, that's what I, it, I see here, the reminiscent of uh, uh, becoming zombies. And, and Yeah, I, th this has upset some people because they think I'm mocking Jesus and the disciples. What I am doing, though, is critiquing the sort of the colonization of others, making them exactly like us. Uh, right. Because zombies, when you get touched by a zombie, you become one. And uh, sort of this, this brainless, uh, you know, entity on the earth so and I, uh, I think some people use uh, say sheeple yeah yeah this is just a more gro grotesque i think image of, of that <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, be yeah. transformed by the rechewing of your mind that's right because <laughs> zombies like brains right so <laughs> they like re they like chewing brains so i i think some people might look at this and they go you know are you a little bitter? I mean, is it, uh, I mean, it, I get that, you know, I, I think as an artist, uh, you know, I'm a musician, I write, I, you know, I think we become better when we were expressing our thoughts uh, on paper uh -huh. or you're putting your art to, uh, you know, to canvas right here. But I mean, is there any uh, bitterness towards uh, the church as a whole or, or have you kind of reconciled with, with that? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> no, I, I'd say I've, I've reconciled, uh, the, the, um, as you can see from the date on that cartoon there, you're showing right now, it's 2011. Mm -hmm. That would have been the year after I left the church. Things were pretty fresh then. Yeah. I'd say, um, the uh and but this is this is what it means to be naked right to be raw to be real right uh i i i dragged people who wanted to come along with me through my grief process through through everything so when i was angry or disappointed or depressed or you know bargaining and i actually did go through a bargaining stage where i was like you know maybe i should go back you know maybe i could figure out a way to you know maybe start a church in a home somewhere or Maybe I can join the United Universalist Church or, you know, I, I, I was trying to figure out. So, you know, I went through all the things where I was like denial, 
and anger and bargaining and depression, but finally acceptance and peace. And uh, I am in a, a, pace, a place of peace now. But uh, one of the things I like to clarify with people is just because I'm criticizing some things I think are unhealthy about the church doesn't mean I don't like the church. Um, it's, and it's kind of like graffiti artists uh, who uh, do graffiti on the side of buildings. Let's take, for example, Banksy, who uh, I really like as, as a street artist. And um, he's addressing, you know, political and justice and social issues uh, in his street art. And the same with many, um, many graffiti artists. It's, it's not like they're trying to destroy everything. It's like they want to see improvement and change and transformation. And I'm the same way. I, I have a lot of uh, respect and love for the church, uh, which is why I, I talk about it all the time. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, I have some friends who've left the church and are like, why are you still messing with the church? I mean, leave it, leave it go. It's useless. It's destructive. We hate it. It should be banned from the earth. And I don't agree with that. So um, I, I totally think people should have the right to gather together. Um, but I'd love to see it done in a healthy manner, which is hard to do and sometimes rare. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm about. So I think a lot of people are afraid when you say the word deconstruction that you are deconstructing it completely to atheism or, uh, you know, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It doesn't always lead down that road. It doesn't always lead. Uh, now, I, I have friends who deconstructed completely into atheism or agnosticism or, you know, uh, there, there's... There's four, there's four quadrants. Uh, I, I kind of like to use this as a, a model where people might find themselves. There's a, and so on one half, one side is the Gnostic side and the other half is the agnostic side. So Gnostic means knowing uh, in Greek. Agnostic means not knowing. And on, the, so on, and on either side, you've got believer and unbeliever or atheist and, and non-atheist. So, you could have a Gnostic believer and they know they believe and they know there's a God. You could have an agnostic believer who believes, but they, they, they can't prove there's a God, but they do believe there's a God. On the other side, you've got a Gnostic atheist who's like, there, there is no God and they know there is no God. And an agnostic atheist is somebody who doesn't believe in God, but you, you can't prove there isn't a God either. And, and so I find that very useful for helping people maybe understanding where they are. And sometimes people like slide around. They just move around. those. Right. It's, it's hard labeling. Uh, I mean, we're kind of victims of being labeled no matter, no matter exactly. what. Um, and that's it, one of my cartoons. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I did a cartoon of a bunch of cans on a beach. Yes. I, and, I didn't see uh, that. they've all got labels on them, believer, agnostic, atheist, all this. And one can's lying, just relaxing in the sun, a big smile on its face with no label. And they're like, what is it? What is it? I'm trying to figure yeah. it out. He's not worried about it because it doesn't matter to him. It, it's the people around him that need to know how to categorize him and where to put him. I think that's, that's where it lies is, is I can, I can take a glance at, at, who you are, uh, these snapshot pictures of who you are on Twitter or social media, and I can formulate in my mind, this is who this guy is, whether it's accurate or not, uh, yes. without getting to know you and, and walking in life with you. Right. Um, and I think that's what's what it's so easy for us to do is, is people can judge me by one snapshot uh, and, and label you. Uh, and I think that's your whole goal is, is free yourself of that, that worry. Exactly. Uh, and it, it, it's so, yeah, no, I, I, it, it is very difficult um, not to label or, you know, you're going to be labeled. Yes. It's just people's nature. You're going to, you're going to be. So that the, the trick is to resist the temptation to label yourself because <coughs> the inside of the can doesn't need a label. It knows what it is. And it's the, it's the people on the outside that are reading the label to figure out what you are. And behind it is there's a lot of anxiety and fear because I know there's some people 
you know, they'll come on my Instagram or whatever. And they're like, are you a Christian or not? And behind their question is, I need to know if I can follow you or not. If I need to know if I'm allowed to read your posts. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's one of the anxieties behind uh, a lot of these questions. Plus, you know, it's a human thing. Like if I, if I know you're uh, uh, a deconstructing uh, person, um, we have a lot more in common and it's easier to talk and we can use certain kind of language. It just makes it easier. We don't have to do any cross-cultural communication. And, um, you know, so when, when, if somebody thinks I'm an atheist, and there are people who do, uh, they will, would find it very, very difficult to talk with me and uncomfortable. So they'd rather not, you know, uh, if I was, a, if, the, if they thought I was a believer, then they, all of a sudden, they've got an arsenal of words and language and uh, commonality to make a conversation easier. So I understand the anxiety behind wanting to use labels. Uh, but that's for them out there. It's not for me. I'm going to go back and look at a couple more of these uh, sure. here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've yeah. got the, uh, the outsiders yeah. of the church. How, how do you feel we can do better to love our gay community? Yeah. Yeah, so if anybody uh, um, has trouble with sight, uh, I'll just explain the cartoon. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, rainbow sheep standing on top of each other looking inside church windows. And the first one said, he's saying God loves us all the same. And the second one says, that's good, right? <coughs> and then the last one says, oh, wait, he just said, but. And... Um, you know, a lot of people find comfort in that cartoon because it sort of validates how they've been treated. You know, God loves you, but you got to change um, or you can't be the way you are or you got to repent or whatever. And uh, but it, this has also upset some people um, because they do think love comes with conditions and, you know, they'll pull out the good old fashioned uh, love the sin or hate the sin kind of thing. Um, so, uh, I, I just think we, we need to understand love better. And, um, I, I don't like using the word grace because it assumes that, uh, gay people or LGBTQ, LGBTQ people need, uh, forgiveness. This cartoon is, uh, Jesus is inside a church with a bunch of white sheep and there's a rainbow sheep wanting in. And a, a white sheep leader, I presume, says, sorry, but you're just not welcome here. And then Jesus leaves with the rainbow sheep and the white sheep say, hey, where'd Jesus go? This upset a lot of people because... Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, I, but I wanted to... This is a radical thing. Uh, um, and, you know, we can get into this whole discussion. I, 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 I was on an interview couple weekends ago with a uh, and everybody all the listeners were on the lgbtq people and <laughs> it's a huge issue where um uh people who are straight or whatever um, um orthodox traditional christianity and theology think they have all the time in the world to, dis to discuss this problem or issue I prefer to call it a reality uh, with LGBTQ people. And, um, you know, they're waiting for some ingenious Bible scholar to come along and finally find the key to understanding all the scripture. And now we'll know whether being gay is a sin or not. That's never going to happen. But we'll just keep on waiting and waiting and waiting while uh, LGBTQ people languish on the outside. Um, of an unaffirming church. So I, I wanted to address that. And I do address that in a lot of my cartoons that uh, the luxury, uh, discussing it and having dialogue and having meetings and studying the Bible and all this is a luxury of uh, the people who are on the inside. And, you know, a lot of believers who are maybe aren't 
affirming of LGBTQ people would agree that, or think that in the earliest church, uh, that um, Paul got upset with people who wouldn't include the Gentiles in the church, right? Yeah. And into the people of God. And, and Paul issued a warning. Look, you're in danger. You're, right now you're the root and you can graft in these branches, but you're in danger of being uprooted and then becoming the root. And so I wanted to kind of convey that, 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 you know, this is a luxury. You think, you know, you can say to somebody, you're not welcome here um, and think you can still keep Jesus. But I think that you need to examine that. I think that needs to be examined. You know, <clears throat> I have friends, there's a local church here that's really popular and big and, you know, it has all the smokes and mirrors and, um, you know, uh, dry ice and lights and worship music and the whole nine yards, but it's not an affirming church. Mm -hmm. And um, I have people inviting me to go on and I say, look, look, that'd be like it asked me to come to a restaurant that serves whites only. It's, it's that serious for me. Do you believe that uh, <clears throat> they, I guess, I guess they all have the right to be a, a non-affirming church, but do you believe they all have to be uh, an affirming church? Well, I, 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 I think truth demands it. I'm not demanding it or expecting it, but I think truth um, demands that these churches that are unaffirming need to examine themselves. And uh, my hope, is that they would come to the place to see that affirming is really the only just and, and compassionate option. Yeah, I'm, I'm not serious about it. I think I, you know, and that's why I cartoon about it at least once or twice a week, because I think this is the line in the sand. I think this is the hill the church is gonna die on. I really do. Uh, because you're, you're excluding uh, a whole group of people um, based on, something they can't help, whether, you know, right. and, and, and so I, uh, and I even want to kind of uh, pedal back on that. Um, even if somebody chose to be gay, I think they have the right to do that. So um, it's, uh, you know, I think it's that serious of an issue. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure you I want think to we can all go in that direction, but theological debate uh, of, you know, God gave us the right to choose. You know, uh, and uh, yeah, and who are we to take that choice uh, away, right? So, right, um, all right. Uh, so overall, uh, what what is your hope and your your you know, tell me about the lasting supper. What what is this? What do you what do you do with the lasting supper? Is that something? Well, the lasting supper is my online community. Uh, people um, uh, pay to join. There's a small monthly fee. Uh, that's for many reasons. It's because it takes a lot of my time. I need to eat and feed my family sure. and it helps keep out trolls. And the people who do pay to join really do appreciate it because it's very safe and um, protected. And we spend a lot of time making sure it is that way. And it's basically for people who are deconstructing, who are questioning their beliefs or wrestling and struggling to stay in the church or to leave or the ministry or whatever. And they just need a place where they don't feel alone and where they can be heard and they can just vent and process and uh, <coughs> find some support along the way. Because that's one of the um, things, I, the reason I started The Lasting Supper back in 2012 was because I myself was lonely. And, um, you know, not a lot of people were talking about deconstruction and all this kind of thing. And um, so I, I, uh, I started this community, online community, to help people realize, you know what, you're not going crazy. You're not alone. And this is actually really healthy, what you're doing. And you just need to hear that over and over again. And you just need some friends and some support. And uh, so that's what we provide there. So we, we basically, you know, we have some videos and interviews of the members and I send out letters every week and we, we have our private uh, Facebook group where we interact with one another. That's a very busy spot. And then uh, we're having Zoom hangouts at least once a week. So it's, cool. it's really cool. 
I think and it's kind of cool that it's happened, you know, that it's, that it was already active before the, you know, quarantine hit. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool that there's that alternative for people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, of course, now we're realizing how much community plays a role in shaping us and, absolutely. Uh, and, and what kind of void we have when we don't have uh, right. people with commonalities and, and things that we can, we can sharpen each other. Right. And how important that is, especially yeah. in these times. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really cool. We just met last night and, you know, it's supposed to be an hour and we went two and a half hours and, uh, you know, we're just sitting there having our beer, or glass of wine or bourbon or whatever we're drinking and just talking and sharing stories and, you know, and what most of us deal with uh, who are deconstructing is it's not just the theological anguish that many people go through or, you know, the feelings of rejection from the church and all that, but you know, how to, how to relate to your Christian friends or your family or whatever, how, how to deal with all that. So it's a very interesting, uh, you know, interaction that takes place in the community. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, David, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Um, I want to direct people again to Naked Pastor, uh, David Hayward on Twitter, and then NakedPastorStore.com. And you can yep. find all his cartoons are for sale. He's got uh, you've got some learning materials and some and some classes that you're offering there. Yeah. Uh, so David, thank you so much for spending time with uh, us today. Normally, I would have a bourbon or something uh, as well. I just have a I'm at the office, so I'm not going to bring my my bourbon <laughs> to the office. So a different kind of brew. Uh, here, of course, yeah. my Texas mug, my extra large, everything's bigger in Texas. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, thanks so much. If there's one thing you would like to end with, uh, what what's your, your overall message uh, for people? Yeah, I just, you know what, I I have a, a sign in my studio that says, "Help people," and I just love to help people. So, if you want to reach out, I'm really good at responding to private messages or direct messages or emails or whatever reach out and I'll, I'll get back to you. I promise. And, um, you can find me all across all social media. I'm there naked pastor and, uh, would love to hook up. So thanks for having me on the show. Thank you, David. And thank you for not actually being naked. Yeah. For the yeah. Show. Totally PG. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take care, David. Bless you. And you uh, we'll talk to you later. All right.